So this is the FujiNet. It's a Wi-Fi, Bluetooth, and SD card device for the the Atari 8 bits, 400, 800 XL, etc. Um, it comes in a nice 3D printed case. It has a uh, has the design language of the original machine. It's also an open source device, so you can build your own. Uh, there's a there's a GitHub repository you can get all the design files uh, and software from. So a little bit about the SIO port and why it's such a nice thing for hardware designers. It's this port on the right of my 800XL. And the OS does a lot of things to help you through the SIO port. It can boot off an SIO device, which is tremendously important because then you don't need ROMs on your device. Also, there's fewer pins to level shift. We can pair the Spectronet, which is a similar device to the Spectrum. You'll see the board's much bigger. It has a lot more chips on it. Of course, this helps users too because smaller board fewer chips makes the uh, makes the device less expensive and easier to assemble if you're building a kit. It's not the only SIO device that's relatively new. This is an SIO PC which connects the PC via USB to the Atari. So anyway, without further ado, we'll take it apart because of course we will. Um, so I take out the four screws. Get the ease the case. I have to be fairly careful. I'm never sure whether these 3D printed cases are particularly strong. So there's a pass-through at the bottom for the uh, SIO, so you can connect to disk drive as well. There's a uh, the module, the Wi-Fi module at the top, um, so that gives you Wi-Fi and Bluetooth. The antenna's the black bit. It's a PCB antenna, so if we ease the board out and have a better look at it, on the uh, on that side, you got the, the connector for the machine uh, itself. Nice FujiNet logo there. Um, URL to the GitHub repository. Uh, if you have a look at the the back side of the board, we can see better now. Switches and the uh, ESP32 Wi-Fi and Bluetooth module. Presumably the two chips at the bottom, uh, buffering and level shifting. So the ESP32 can do absolutely everything else. I mean, the SIO is not that fast by modern standards, so there's no problem decoding that in software and, and all that kind of stuff. So anyway, if we uh, plug it into the Atari, I'll demonstrate how it works. So as you see, it looks very nice with the XL. The XL is a little, probably needs retro -brighting. Uh, turn it on, connect up our uh, capture capture board, and so it starts with the logo. And the, the main way of making it work, that main menu is a disk browser. So there's a protocol called TNFS, the Trivial Network File System, which is designed to be easy to implement on an 8-bit system. So we set Jet Set Willy uh, and mount it. And that's just a that's going off my own local server downstairs, and then press Option to boot and we can load the game. Uh, the one downside you'll note about uh, serial ports that are designed in the late 1970s is they're not tremendously fast, um, but they're good enough. I mean, a, a board with a parallel connection directly on the CPU bus would load a game quicker, but as we'll see, it really isn't that long, so I think the trade-off's worth it, really. So, and this, by the way, is a really nice port of the original Spectrum version of Jet Set Willy. It even has the Spectrum font, uh, but it's got this great soundtrack behind it, uh, which I really like. It's actually quite a long tune if you let it go through and loop all the way through. But yeah, it's, it's absolutely perfect copy for the Atari um, of Jet Set Willy. If you, if you get the original Jet Set Willy from the 80s, the original port, it's nowhere near this good. It, it looks pretty terrible, to be honest. And as you can see, the same old annoying having to jump through the stairs is uh, is present in the game, as we all anyone who played JSW will remember. So, of course, it's not only you, you can't only just load disk images and that kind of thing with the FujiNet. It also has a programming API and can also emulate a modem. So, if we load up some terminal software here, we can have a have a go at going on to level 29, which is Reddit's uh, Retro Battle Station's official bulletin board. So let it load. Um, and it's an 80 column terminal, this, so it's a little bit hard to see on composite video. But um, 
it's it's good enough. Uh, so you t you type at net one, which is it's like a haze app command that tells the Fuji net to emulate a modem, and then you can do ATDT, which was to tell a modem to do tone dialing. But instead of a phone number, you're putting an internet address, which can be a DNS address. And there we go, we're into level 29. This this particular piece of terminal software does, I think, have some bugs in it, because as you'll see in a moment, the screen corrupts. There's, there's plenty of other terminal software, so you're not really limited to this particular one. Uh, and that's that's another nice feature, because you can emulate the mode and basically any of the any of the stuff from back in the day, you can get to work. Uh, so in this particular one, emulates a VT100 terminal and there you go some uh, logging onto the bulletin board who last logged on uh, and off we go there you go there's a the screen corruption so I, I suspect that's a bug in this program but um, just another little demo we can log on to if we quit this you'll see that you'll see also it generates the no carrier so old communication software really does think it's talking to a modem um, so we'll log on to Shades, which is a multi-user dungeon. It's one of the first mods. I think it first started running in about 1987 or so, and it's still running today, uh, which is kind of cool. But I used to play it back in the day, well, until I ran up a huge telephone bill and my dad just about half killed me, and then my modem was taken away from me. But anyway, so there you go shade, uh, with Shades. I won't log in because it doesn't... It, I don't think it, it, it'll um, hide my password and I don't really want to give my persona name and password to the whole of YouTube so we'll just disconnect from here and go on to the next thing but yeah it's kind, kind of nice being able to run old terminal software so there are other things you can do with the FujiNet it does have its own programming API so uh, you can basically anything you do with the network you'd write an IRC client or you could do something like this which is a ISS viewer, which tells us about who's in space and where the ISS is, um, and also who's who's up in space right now. So this will be most likely pulling this data from the REST API. So there we go, we've got the ISS position, and we can also get who's in space now. So we've got the uh, people on the ISS here. Uh, 10 people in space right now, so yeah, the I uh, and then not all of the 10 people are on the ISS, some are in the, uh, in the Chinese space mission, which we see now, Shenzhou 15. So, yeah, the, you, can, you can write other programs, you could develop network games. There are a few network games on some of these TNFS servers, which I've yet to try. So here's the FujiNet news reader. Um, it gives us several categories of news we can look at. We've got a nice FujiNet logo on the top. So if we select technology, uh, we can have a look at why the uh, FAA's NOTAM system melted down last week, uh, which was a bit of a problem if you were flying in the US, because uh, it put a grand stop on all airline flights, uh, which probably was a, a chaos, probably went on all day, no doubt, because of the, uh, the sort of cascade issues. But it's, it's kind of like reading news back when Teletext ruled the roost or even Prestel. You got these sort of pages of 40 column formatted news to read. So anyway, uh, that's a quick tour of the Fujinets. I hope you enjoyed it. See you next time.